Your support helps us bring you programs you love. Go to wyomingpbs.org, click on support, and become a sustaining member or an annual member. It's easy and secure. Thank you. Was oil worth anything before the automobile? Ask Marco Polo. He saw oil burning stoves six centuries ago along the Spice Trail. Phil Roberts explores the history of oil next on Wyoming Chronicle. Phil Roberts might be called Wyoming's historian. All aspects of the state's past and present seem to interest him. And you can find his breadth of knowledge in his Wyoming Almanac or in the variety of courses he's taught at the University of Wyoming. Now Roberts is taking a historic look at a commodity that has fueled Wyoming's economy for a long time, oil. He's taking the long view all the way back to Mesopotamia 3,000 years ago. But before we drill deep into the past, Let's dance in the present. The second program in Wyoming PBS's Wind River Showcase will air this month. You can check details on dates at our website, wyomingpbs.org. We've got an excerpt from that show to whet your appetite. It's Tika Brock from Sheridan, and it rocks. What are some of your earliest memories of music? Um, my sister and I grew up listening to the Judds and um, Dolly Parton and stuff like that. So her and I would sing together and do little concerts for her mom in the living room. And um, so yeah, I would I would say the s probably six seven years old mm -hmm. singing to the Judds. Was it uh, primarily country music you listened to early on? Yep, all. Country. <laughs> Thank you. 
The Wyoming Music Showcase with Tika Brock airs on December 30th on Wyoming PBS. Now we're going to have a conversation with Phil Roberts, our favorite historian at Wyoming PBS. He's the go-to guy when we have a question about Wyoming history for one of our documentaries. Now like any good historian, he knows how to connect the dots. Roberts has traveled and studied in the Middle East, and he discovers that some of the early dealings between Westerners and Middle Eastern Emirates were modeled on negotiations between landmen in the American West and Indian tribes. Well, Phil, many people in the U.S. don't think of oil as having a history because it's right here in our lives all the time. You know, it's in our cars, it's in the Gulf, it's all around us. But you're teaching a course on the history of oil. That's right. I'm teaching this course, and uh, I'm starting about 3,000 years ago. I didn't know it went back that far. It so. did. It okay. did. In uh, ancient Mesopotamia, there's a record of oil being uh, being utilized as early as 3,000 years ago. And of course, on, in the American West, the American Indians used uh, used oil for medicinal purposes and right. for liniments, and and uh, they would frequently find the oil floating on the top of uh, water springs, and they would sane that oil off and they would use it for, for paint or for medicines or for liniments. Uh, that was true right here in Fremont County. Oh, absolutely, in Fremont right. County, all throughout Wyoming, yeah. in fact. But uh, oil really got started, at least uh, many of the early references to oil, in uh, the area around the Caspian. Mm. In, uh, in as early as 1600, uh, there were reports of people digging hand dug wells. And even before that, when Marco Polo came through that area about 1400, he reported the fact that people were using oil for heating and for cooking. Huh. And then, of course, in the early part of the 19th century, the first drilled oil well that Americans often think came about in Titusville, Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. actually is predated by about 12 years with an oil well near Baku in Azerbaijan. Huh. And uh, I had the good fortune of going over there and looking around. I didn't see the first one. And but what uh, would that oil have been used for? And the oil over the nineteenth century. The oil in the nineteenth century was uh, almost, uh, well, at least uh, early on, was used for lubrication. Mm -hmm. right. But then came the development of kerosene, right. and then it became an illumination fuel. And what's very interesting about about the oil industry is that everyone predicted when Edison came out with the light bulb. There it goes. That's it. Yeah. Oil is no longer going to be useful except for kerosene that you might be able to take out to these very isolated areas that would never be hooked up to electricity. Right. But as far as uh, a general commodity, it was a it was something of the past. And and of course John D. Rockefeller was one of the many people in the world who who uh, took a look at that and said, well, there may be some money to be made in the industry, and he started uh, in the 1870s, mm -hmm. started uh, late 1870s and early 80s, started consolidating and buying up a lot of the smaller companies. Standard oil, sure. That's right. And they called it, they used to call it rock oil, didn't they? They did. The original ter well, I say original term, my history goes back to 1850, and you've gone back to, you know, 6,000 years ago or mm -hmm. something, so. Yeah, and, and actually there's some, some uh, examples where rock oil is actually advertised as part of a label for medicine. Hmm. Yeah. And they would say, Dr. So-and-so's um, uh, rock oil, <laughs> and, right. and there's a thing called uh, called Maverick lim liniment uh -huh. that I've seen ads for that was made almost entirely of oil. Huh. Wow. So it was uh, it used in m many of those ways. The interesting thing about the Rockefeller Standard Oil Company is it was a Rockefeller Standard Oil Company that helped push a lot of the early oil pioneers out to Wyoming hmm. because Rockefeller was starting to dominate the Pennsylvania and Ohio oil fields yep. and a lot of individuals who had been interested in drilling there got pushed out. Right. So and so they came out to where Rockefeller hadn't yet been, yeah. and that's to Wyoming. And, uh, and of course, Mike Murphy, who uh, is probably known to people in Fremont County anyway, mm -hmm. was uh, the first person in Fremont County, or free first person in Wyoming to drill an oil well, and that was out here by Dallas Dome. Yep, and we should probably date that because I think for most people, when you look back at the history of oil in Wyoming, they just go to Teapot Dome, and that's about it. So. Yeah, and, uh, and this is about uh, 18... Uh, 1882-83 okay. mm -hmm. that, uh, that Murphy came out and, uh, and that well came in at Dallas Dome. And of course there's a sign out there now that right. says 
Wyoming's oldest oil field, and uh, and I understand that they're still producing some oil out there. So, yeah. remarkable that, that 130 years later, yeah. that uh, oil field is uh, still producing something anyway. And, and really, that kind of spans what you might call the oil era in America. You know, from the from the early development of oil wells to the point where the combustion, the internal combustion engine came on. Uh, up to today when we are very much, our lives are entwined with oil. Mm -hmm. And that's what really revolutionized oil was yeah. the, was the uh, adoption of, uh, of the internal combustion engine. Yeah. And of course, uh, Wyoming was a pioneer in that area too, as you know, uh, right. with uh, a bicycle ma mechanic by the name of Elmer Lovejoy from Laramie who, who assembled a, an automobile out of bicycle parts and an engine he had ordered from the east in May of 1898. Mm -hmm. And it became the first car in the Rocky Mountain region. Yeah, and uh, drove around Laramie. There's a really funny comment that the Laramie Boomerang made about uh, about uh, Lovejoy's car. He, they said, "Well, this thing might be useful as a toy, but uh, we don't see any other possible purpose for it. <laughs> it uh, it just bothers horses and uh, and causes noise, and uh, <laughs> and it's never going to amount to much." Right. Great. Great prognosticators there. Mm -hmm. Well, let's talk about some of the other things you've done. I think, you know, when you begin telling these, these stories from Wyoming history, that's what everybody knows you for. But you are spending a lot of time overseas in recent years, really goes back a while, mm -hmm. and a lot of that time in the Middle East, which is another place, obviously, that we all think about when we think of oil. Mm -hmm. So what, what actually got a history professor from Wyoming traveling in Dubai and some of these mm -hmm. faraway places? Well, the curious thing about it is that my, my wife took a job teaching journalism in uh, first in the United Arab Emirates in Dubai mm -hmm. back in the 1990s, and, uh, and I at first went along for the sun yeah. during the, the Christmas breaks, but while I was over there, I became very interested in the rather scant history of oil in that part of the world, mm -hmm. and uh, I started visiting various museums and, uh, and national collections, and I started seeing interesting parallels between the way oil developed in Wyoming and, and other parts of the Rocky Mountain West with the way it developed in the, in the Middle East. And I thought, well, maybe we can tease this out into a comparative study and we can hmm. see how some of these same kinds of trends, even though it's across cultures yeah. and across time, there are some uh, some similarities that we might learn some lessons from. Yeah, is it is it the colonial model? I mean, what is it that, that you where 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 did you start seeing some, those parallels? Some of it is the colonial model, but I can go a little further back because uh, there's there's actually a very interesting uh, situation in the Emirates that uh, that developed in the roughly 1920s, uh -huh. where a oil explorer who was doing some work for a couple of companies went to the uh, to one of the sheikhs over there and uh, and told the sheikh that he would like to explore for oil and uh, the sheikh didn't really have any boundaries for his territory right. nor was he in very good economic shape because uh, the pearling industry had gone gone down after the the development of cultured pearls and we're talking so about the pearl diving industry. Yes, they, he yeah, was a pearl sure. diver. Okay. They, they were mm -hmm. pearl divers. His yeah. uh, tribe uh, dived for pearls. And yeah. so he's anxious for the income. And so this uh, particular uh, oil uh, uh, landman, I guess you could s say, yeah. perhaps, sure. he, said, uh, he said, well, I want to deal with, with one person. Mm -hmm. I want to deal with one person on this. And, and uh, I understand that you have allowed for a very a very rudimentary parliament, um, a majlis sort of system to develop here. Yeah. I don't want to have to deal with that because I've had to deal with with tribes, Indian tribes in the American West. Yeah. And if I deal with the tribe, he was not telling the sheikh this, but he knew that if he was dealing with the tribe, he probably wouldn't be able to get as good a deal uh -huh. as if he were dealing with just one person. And so he, he uh, used some experiences that he apparently had uh, had utilized in the American West yeah. uh, hmm. to to make these deals with the with the sheikh right. and uh, and I'm not saying that uh, that corruption wasn't a part of it, sure. but uh, but these deals turned out to be very similar in terms of the legal language and all of that right. that oil companies had made with uh, Indian tribes in the American West. And and if you follow the course of, of oil development and and the countries involved uh, in the Middle East and compare that 
to the effect that oil has had and oil development has had here. Do you see parallels as well? Yes, and there are remarkable booms and busts. Yeah. And, uh, and what, uh, what uh, Dubai particularly has done mm -hmm. is try to uh, modulate those some mm -hmm. and to, to lessen the boom I impact and, and eliminate the bust part by diversifying very yeah, we, dramatically. We always talk about that here. I mean, do you think successfully? Can you tell from what you've seen? Uh, I think they have. Okay. Uh, of course, uh, that would be a little hard to, uh, to assert with the same kind of authority after the financial collapse of the end of 2008. We, but we all hear about Dubai and we see pictures of the city with the huge uh, monstrous buildings in it and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Is that, yeah. Yeah, and I think the, the fact that the, the uh, economy of Dubai is essentially 7% dependent on oil. Oh really? Not, not that much. And yeah. because it's such a small amount, uh, yeah. they have pretty successfully diversified, at least from the, the booms and busts of the oil industry. Now, mm -hmm. of course, a worldwide financial collapse is not something that uh, the Sheikh would have, would have uh, thought about, nor would any of us have ever right. thought about something like that. But, sure. but uh, ever since 1894, Wyoming has uh, been talking about how we need to diversify our economy. We have to get away from <laughs> from <laughs> minerals and, and agriculture and we have to diversify. I it. almost start to fall asleep when I hear it because I've <laughs> heard it so often and yeah. here we are. Yeah, and, and in fact, I, a number of years ago, I looked through the uh, campaign literature for people yeah. who ran for governor and I found that just about every candidate from 1894 forward included somewhere in their campaign literature the fact that they were going to diversify the Wyoming economy because sure. we can't continue like this in these tremendous uh, boom and bust cycles right. and uh, expect to ever have anything economically in Wyoming, any kind of economic stability. And, and that brings us to talk a little bit about the future and, and what a historian sees who's watched these developments over many, many years. Uh, we can talk about oil, we can talk about fossil fuels generally in Wyoming's future. What, what does your crystal ball show? Well, I think uh, it's going to be difficult because, because we're not like a, uh, a top-down uh, situation like, uh, like is in Dubai. We don't yeah, have the shake sure, that's, right. uh, that's determining that eventually we're going to be 93% uh, of our economy is not going to be based on these natural resource uh, Sure. Uh, minerals, but but I think it's an incentive for us to look at. You mean our, our politicians don't get along and agree on things <laughs> and just make decisions? Jeez, uh -huh. I'm well, shocked. Well, I think it's I think that's an incentive though to yeah. for politicians to say, here is an opportunity in the boom times. Yeah, and I think we've seen a little of that uh, lately with uh, with the uh, uh, construction of uh, projects that aren't necessarily connected in any way to to uh, sure. natural resources at the university and the community colleges and elsewhere, yeah. where it is, uh, is going a long way toward at least trying to, to spend the money while we have it for things that are not necessarily uh, from uh, uh, natural resources or right. not furthering natural resources as much as trying to diversify into other areas. So I think it's a very important thing that we're doing right now. And one of the notions that you hear out there, but you've been hearing it probably for, well, maybe as long as time, but at least in the last 40 or 50 years we've been hearing it, that's the end of oil, really meaning the end of fossil fuels, that we're coming to the end of that cycle or that period in history. Mm -hmm. But as we've heard others say, uh, the notion of peak oil, that moment when you've hit the maximum use of that resource and it begins to decline, that keeps getting pushed further out. Mm -hmm. So is it wrong? I mean, the books you see that say the end of oil, is that just not true? Well, let me use history again as sure. an example. And uh, uh, back at the time when the United States was switching the, uh, the U.S. naval fleet yeah. from coal burning ships to oil burning ships, at that time, there were oil experts who said, you better not do that because mm -hmm. by 1920 or by 1925, the world is going to be out of no oil. oil. Sure. So the U.S. Navy said, well, we need to do that, but here's what we'll do. We'll put out, uh, we'll establish some reserves. Uh -huh. And that's when the Teapot Dome or the Naval Petroleum Reserve Number 2 came into you're, existence. You're brilliant at tying this into Wyoming history, I've got to say. But yeah, yes. I, I've <laughs> always said that uh, Wyoming has a connection to everything in the world. So, yeah. okay. uh, so I, think, uh, I think we can make that. But, yeah. but what they tried to do, at least, was to realize that there had to be, at least for the short term or medium term, there had to be an emergency supply. Yeah. But, uh, of course, that doesn't answer the question because Eventually, what happened in the 20s was that oil was found in, uh, in places that they would have never expected to find it. And then by the 30s in the Middle East and, 
and uh, Iran and, and Venezuela and, and the next thing you know they're finding deep oil deposits in, uh, in Saudi Arabia and, uh, yep. and it go went on and on. Now obviously we all know that there is going to be an end. You there think, although, although you keep wondering, because new technology, then we're going into oil shale or tar sands or various other f sources. We just keep mm -hmm. coming up with new things. Uh -huh. But I think each time it yeah. gets more expensive. Right. And so because it makes the, makes the oil more expensive, of course the, the last barrel of oil is going to be the most expensive barrel. Sure, right. But if we can keep that in mind and, and think about using oil for the, uh, for the future, mm -hmm. for plastics and for, for high value products right. and switch uh, as much as we can to alternative energy for heating and for, for locomotion and such things. I think we're going to be on the right track. But you're not, you're not the sheikh and you can't make that happen. That's and right. I guess and one of the things I'd ask you as a historian, what about this attitude that Americans have? I mean, they've been able to consume this way and they're importing a lot of it, but they don't seem to show any inclination to stop. It's very difficult because uh, I know many people have, have noticed this when they've traveled in Europe in particular. The, yeah. the price of, of oil or price of gasoline per liter right. is eye-popping. Yeah. And people have become accustomed to that because it's been the price, uh, it's been a much higher price for many, many years. Yep. Here in the U.S. the price goes up uh, to not even that level right. and people start to scream. And I think what's going to eventually happen is that we're going to be be equivalent to to Europe and prices and it's going to have a huge impact on again places like Wyoming where we have long distances to travel and right. we're going to have to come up with uh, with some some cheaper way to uh, to fuel our our transport in particular and if we're like Dubai we should maybe be looking now I'm not trying to put words in your absolutely mouth, but, you know absolutely and we yeah. should be looking now not only in in respect to that but also in respect to uh, to maintaining some of the the spirit we have about uh, about construction if uh, uh. if uh, the the state continues to do like they did with the new business college at the University of Wyoming and and some of those buildings that are that are heavily energy efficient and if uh, if uh, private industry and, and individuals can take on that same spirit maybe we don't have to have any kind of direction. Maybe we can do it by sort of accidental consensus that often happens in sure. Wyoming. We get things right. done by accidental consensus. Uh, your, your ability to kind of draw from all different periods of Wyoming history is kind of legendary, and I think this gives us a, a last minute opportunity for you to talk about the Wyoming Almanac, oh. which you and your brothers put together, and, and contains a lot of this information. It does, and, it, and we're so, it, it is such a, an interesting project for us to do. It's the sixth edition. Yeah. And uh, back in the 1980s, we did the first edition when there wasn't even computerized typesetting. And, <laughs> and, but it's been a hobby that, uh, that we've done. Uh, started many years ago when uh, the three of, three of us, my brother Steve, my brother David, and I sat around a Thanksgiving table and we said we, we, we'd always quiz each other about some <laughs> obscure fact in Wyoming history. Yep. And finally, Brother Steve said, you know, we ought to do something about that. And Brother David said, well, let's put it into a book. And, that's and that how book just keeps getting thicker it's, and thicker. It's 600, over 600 pages now. Sure. started out about a uh, little less than 300. So yep. it's, it's doubled in size, and uh, we have great fun doing it. Well, it's I was going to say, winter's project. coming. It's something to curl up by the fire with. Phil, thanks very much for being with us again. Thank you for having me. Okay. The end of oil has been predicted for as long as there's been a hub to grease or a furnace to fire. But it doesn't go away. As Phil Roberts says, it just gets more expensive. And as history tells us, expect the unexpected. The Wyoming Chronicle, though, we want you to expect insight, depth, and entertainment. If you want to check the shows you've missed or sample a rerun, go to the Wyoming Chronicle page at our website, wyomingpbs.org. Thanks again for joining us on Wyoming Chronicle. There are a lot more stories out there. We'll be back to tell them. This is a steel guitar. I'm good with it.
to you guys if your monitors are reasonable and stuff. I've got you out the front.